Overview of the SBC Movement Secured Party Creditor SBC Movement began as a response to the growing influence of financial institutions and government agencies over individual lives. At its core, the movement advocates for financial independence through a series of sophisticated legal and financial strategies. Central to the movement is the belief that individuals can reclaim control over their financial destinies by understanding and utilizing legal frameworks designed for commercial transactions. This promise of empowerment and privacy has attracted many, especially during times of economic uncertainty. The SBC movement is grounded in the notion that the conventional financial system is inherently flawed and often predatory. By leveraging legal instruments and understanding commercial law, SBC proponents believe they can navigate these systems more effectively and protect their assets. Probably the most compelling argument for the claim that the United States is a corporation comes from Title 28, Section 3002 of the United States Code. United States means a federal corporation. There it is in black and white. The United States means a federal corporation. Or does it? See, Section 3002 reads, As used in this chapter, the United States means a federal corporation, an agency, department, commission, board, or other entity of the United States, or an instrumentality of the United States. One of the foundational beliefs of the SBC movement is that each individual has a strong and illegal fiction created by the government that can be separated from the individual's true self. By becoming a secured party creditor, individuals claim to reclaim their rights and separate their true selves from their strawmen, thereby gaining control over their financial and legal obligations. Why am I filing this? Like a lot of people say, I filed a UCC-1. A UCC-1 is just a notice. It took me a long time to understand a UCC-1 is just a notice. You've given notice to the world that you're the first in line, first in time. It's powerful in the sense that no one subsequent to that filing can come in and get rid of your claim. You got the superior claim. This is about registering claims. How everything where the reason that you're filing a UCC one is because there isn't any money. Money is being created by liens. Everything is about liens in our society. Everything. Money is created through liens. By an interest, value is given to commercial paper if there is a security interest in that paper. Security interests are governed by the UCC first in line, first in time. So value is determined by interest in things. So that is why everybody's trying to put a lien on you. A charge is a lien. They're putting a lien against your social security number. The movement is heavily influenced by the redemption theory which suggests that after the United States went off the gold standard in 1933, the government created secret accounts backed by each citizen's future earnings. SBC adherents believe that by filing the right paperwork and understanding commercial law, they can access these accounts to settle debts and achieve financial sovereignty. The law of the SBC movement lies in its promise of autonomy and financial liberation. In a world where debt and financial instability are common, the idea of being able to discharge debts through legal means is incredibly appealing. This movement offers a form of empowerment that resonates deeply with those feeling disenfranchised by the traditional financial system. However, the movement is not without its controversies and challenges. Legal experts and authorities often view SBC strategies as fraudulent and legally questionable. Many adherents have faced significant legal battles, resulting in fines, imprisonment, and ongoing scrutiny. Despite these challenges, the SBC movement continues to attract followers who are motivated by the promise of financial freedom and a desire to challenge the status quo. The movement's growth and persistence highlight the deep-seated desire for an alternative to conventional financial systems. Chapter 1, The Birth of the SPC Movement The SPC Movement is deeply rooted in historical contexts of economic instability and societal discontent. Influenced by the redemption theory, which posits that the United States declared bankruptcy in 1933 and established secret financial systems, proponents believe they can discharge debts and reclaim financial sovereignty by navigating these systems. This belief has driven many to adopt and spread SBC methodologies, viewing them as a means to achieve true financial independence. Central to this theory is the idea that the government created secret trust accounts for every citizen, which can be accessed to settle debts. Roger Elvick, often credited as the pioneer of the SBC movement, introduced the redemption process based on these principles. 
Elvik's journey began as he sought solutions to financial difficulties faced by Midwest farmers during the economic crises of the 1980s. His methods involved using promissory notes and private trusts to challenge and discharge debts. As the industrial community, because when the Christ was born there on that, uh, in that stable, and Joseph was uh, uh, told in a dream to take the child into, into Egypt, he was told to take the child into, into uh, uh, industry. Why? Because they had made a reservation at a motel or a hotel. And they were and it wasn't until the three wise men came in and paid the bill or deposited the gold, frankincense, and myrrh that uh, the uh, reservation now here, the room was open and they could take the child into commerce here or the new issue. And where did the new issue came from? It came from the east side of the decimal point. At night, by the way, they followed the marshal by night, the marshal star, uh -huh. the star by night, and, they, and it was the uh, three wise men here, or the three zeros here after the decimal point. We're into the third dimension, you see, because <clears throat> the third dimension here is like an ionized account or a charged account. Ionization. Zion, and then we go to Sion. In other words, the redemption and the twinkling of an eye. You close the account, and you open it again, but it's still the same account, same number. The only difference is you're going from the old covenant contract to the new covenant contract, from execution of law to grace. To grace, operation yeah. Law. Or operation. <laughs> right. Or public policy. Right. Same thing. See, policy or insurance money here that can't be used for original issue. It can only be used to fix the... Uh, the uh, new issue and a new issue here was a new child or a new uh, contract chapter 2 roger ulvica the pioneer of its journey began during the economic crises of the 1980s as he sought ways to alleviate financial burdens on midwest farmers faced with widespread economic hardship ulvic's teachings promised a way out by leveraging what he believed were hidden financial truths his methods centered around the Uniform Commercial Code UCC, a comprehensive set of laws governing commercial transactions in the United States. The UCC, according to Ulvik, was a key tool in reclaiming financial sovereignty. He taught that by filing specific documents and creating promissory notes, individuals could tap into their strawman accounts, secret accounts supposedly created by the government for every citizen. This idea was based on the belief that these accounts held significant financial resources that could be used to settle debts. Alvik's seminars and workshops quickly gained popularity, spreading his ideas to a wide audience eager for financial relief. His teachings emphasized the importance of understanding commercial law and the power of properly executed legal documents. Many were drawn to the possibility of discharging debts through these unconventional methods. However, Alvik's methods soon attracted the attention of legal authorities. His use of promissory notes and other financial instruments was deemed fraudulent. In numerous court cases, authorities argued that Elvik's documents were not legitimate financial instruments and that his methods constituted fraud. Despite facing significant legal challenges and eventually being imprisoned for fraud and conspiracy, Elvik's impact on the SBC movement was profound. His ideas laid the foundation for many who followed, shaping the movement's core philosophies and practices. What happened to Roger due to the fact that he decided to become a part of this and we're going to be watching a few snippets of videos with regards to um, Roger and his teachings because just like all the others he too gave seminars. Here's a screenshot of Roger Elvick giving one of those very seminars that we're going to be talking about today but before I do that for those of you that have not heard about this uh, let's talk about the redemption movement. Alvik's impact on the SBC movement was profound. His ideas laid the foundation for many who followed, shaping the movement's core philosophies and practices. 
Elvik's story highlights both the empowering potential and the legal risks inherent in SBC practices. While his teachings offered a sense of control and hope to many, they also exposed adherents to serious legal consequences. Elvik's legacy in the SBC community is a testament to the movement's enduring appeal and its controversial nature. Chapter 3 Winston Shroud, an educator Winston Shroud emerged as a prominent educator within the SPC movement, known for his ability to simplify complex financial concepts. His seminars focused on the use of negotiable instruments, such as IRS Form 10990ID, to manage and offset debts. Shroud's teachings emphasized the concept of reporting income as original issue discount to counterbalance debts. This method involves reporting debt obligations as income, thereby creating a tax credit that can purportedly be used to discharge debts. Now, uh, I, need to, I need to explain acceptance for value because I, I, I'm not sure that you understand what acceptance is. Let me see here if I can get this. I'm going to give you a little bit of a prelude to what we're going to talk about in the morning. I think it's bouncing off that board somehow. Alright. In, in, the, in the debt system that we work in, the most important thing you have is a, is a blue ink pen. Because in the blue ink pen, you can sign your name to anything. Now, when you sign your name to it, you just gave credibility to the document. Now, any, any document that does not have a wet signature on it has no credibility. Alright? So, <clears throat> one, of our, one of our favorite things to do with our blue ink pen is to do acceptances. Now, if you go back in the banking history and so forth, uh, acceptance means it's a banker's acceptance. But because you're defined as a banker under Black's Law Dictionary, you can, you can do banking business. And one, one kind of banking business you can do is acceptance. Acceptance means that you will pay the document. So you're, you're accepting it for payment. So now if, if you pay the document, if you pay the negotiable instrument, to whom does that belong? It's yours. Okay. And so uh, a blue ink pen is a very valuable tool in the world of commerce. So, anybody who sends you a bill and does not send you the check to pay it with has created liability for which they did not provide the remedy. His accessible teaching style and comprehensive materials attracted a wide audience, making him one of the most well-known figures in the SBC community. Shroud's seminars and educational materials were designed to demystify these complex financial processes, making them accessible to the average person. His friendly demeanor and ability to explain intricate financial concepts in layman's terms helped build a loyal following. Many attendees believe that Shroud's methods provided a viable solution to their financial problems, and his teachings spread widely through DVDs, online courses, and public appearances. Despite his popularity and the widespread adoption of his methods, Shroud's practices did not go unnoticed by legal authorities. The use of IRS Form 10990, ID and other financial instruments as Shroud promoted them was seen as fraudulent by the IRS and other legal entities. They argued that these documents were used to create fictitious financial instruments and evade taxes, which are illegal actions under federal law. In 2017, Shroud faced significant legal repercussions for his activities. He was convicted of issuing false financial documents and failing to file tax returns, resulting in a 10-year prison sentence. The court found that Shroud's methods involved creating and distributing fake financial instruments, misleading his followers, and encouraging tax evasion. Shroud's experience underscores the challenges SPC practitioners face when navigating complex legal and financial landscapes. While his teachings offered a semblance of hope and financial control, they ultimately led many into legal troubles. Shroud's case serves as a cautionary tale about the potential dangers of misinterpreting and misapplying financial laws. 
Despite his legal downfall, Shroud's impact on the SBC movement remains significant. His efforts to educate and simplify complex financial concepts have left a lasting impression on many within the community. However, his story also highlights the importance of legal compliance and the risks associated with alternative financial strategies. Good afternoon, everyone. Virgo here. This is just to update you quickly on the court listener site updating Winston Shroud's file. Um, I want to draw your attention here real quickly to um, the last entry, which shows that the Court of Appeals actually filed a motion to dismiss his appeal case uh, or his case where he filed the appeal. Apparently, that's something that is done on a regular basis when somebody actually skips out of their um out of their uh, out of showing up to where he was supposed to show up to the Bureau of Prisons he never did he is now a fugitive of justice and as a result of that the appeal that was filed is being dismissed chapter 4 Tim Turner are the president Tim Turner who declared himself the president of the Republic for the United States brought a unique approach to the SBC movement with a background in law enforcement, Turner advocated for the use of private trusts and UCC filings to assert sovereignty and financial independence. Turner's methods involve filing UCC-1 financing statements to secure personal assets, based on the belief that this would place them beyond governmental reach. His charismatic leadership and bold claims attracted many followers. Turner claimed that by establishing private trusts and filing UCC-1 statements, individuals could declare themselves as sovereign citizens. Amen. That's a beautiful day God has given us today. <clears throat> and section 1, we refer to as the freedom documents. Now the freedom documents, the pur purpose... <laughs> sorry, I get a little loud every now and then. But the, the freedom documents, their purpose is to establish your status. Most of us are debtors to the corporation. Most of us are most of us are debtors to the corporation. And we don't realize how we became debtors in these agreements that we do in the freedom documents help to establish your proper status under the Bill of Rights and the Constitution that established you. Now, the Constitution did not give you any rights. The Bill of Rights did not give you any rights. It just outlined the God-given unalienable rights that were given to you as a birthright for being born on this nation, in this nation. Now, those rights are, are, can't be taken away from you because they were not given to you by a, a government or a corporation that were given to you by God. That's your birthright. Thus operating outside the jurisdiction of conventional legal systems. Turner's teachings emphasize that by filing these documents, individuals could assert their personal sovereignty and protect their assets from government control. He held numerous seminars and public addresses, threading his message and gaining a dedicated following. His methods were seen by many as a way to regain control over their financial and legal standing. However, Turner's activities eventually drew the attention of federal authorities. In 2012, he was convicted of conspiracy to defraud the United States and sentenced to 18 years in prison. The prosecution argued that Turner's methods involved fraudulent financial schemes, including the creation of fake financial documents and attempts to discharge debts illegally. The court found that Turner's strategies not only failed to comply with federal laws but also misled his followers, many of whom faced significant legal and financial repercussions. Turner's case underscores the legal risks associated with challenging established financial systems through unconventional means. Despite the legal challenges and his eventual imprisonment, Turner's influence on the SPC movement remains significant. His story serves as both an inspiration and a cautionary tale. While his teachings offered a sense of empowerment and autonomy, they also highlighted the potential consequences of pursuing alternative financial strategies without a thorough understanding of the law. Gal implications. Turner's legacy in the SBC community is complex. On one hand, he inspired many to seek greater control over their financial destinies. On the other hand, 
His legal troubles serve as a stark reminder of the importance of legal compliance and the potential dangers of misinterpreting financial laws. His story is a testament to the enduring appeal and inherent risks of the SPC movement. Chapter 5 Grad Class The Litigator at Class Known for his extensive legal battles, focused on challenging government authority through administrative procedures and falling leads, his journey into the SPC movement was driven by a desire to combat what he saw as governmental overreach. Trying to educate the American people on what the truth is. It really is not what we're told by the court system or by the government. A lot of backdoor dealings that our government has done, how we went from a government to a corporation to a foreign government within our own system. I have a research team from all over the United States that we work with. And we pulled up a lot of congressional records of the corporation in the United States. People are saying, well, Obama is a foreigner. He can't be president. Yes, he can, because we don't have American people running our offices. That 14th Amendment plays a very vital role on these people holding office. That's how they hold office, and this is why it's never discussed. Because if the information really got out that these people have to hold a 14th Amendment standing in order to hold public office, then they wouldn't have any public office. That changes this over. We're not part of the United States. We're not even a state. Well, if you're not part of the United States and you're not a state, then that means you're a corporation under your own act of 1871. So now you have dissolved our government. But we're also going to get into detail of the bankruptcy of 1933 and of how the Federal Reserve note is not real money through congressional records. This was not done by the people. This was done by congressmen behind closed doors. What they did is they set up our currency to fall in this country and had another currency, a corporation currency. When they created the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, they created a corporate money value setting this country up to give up its own currency. His deep knowledge of administrative law and assertive litigation style earned him a dedicated following. Class advocated for the use of UCC filings and other legal documents to assert personal sovereignty and challenge what he perceived as illegal government actions. Class's approach was rooted in a detailed understanding of administrative law. He argued that by filing specific legal documents, individuals could hold government officials accountable for overstepping their authority. This method, known as commercial lien strategy, involved placing liens on public officials' properties and demanding large sums of money for alleged violations of law. His assertive litigation style and willingness to take on the government made him a prominent figure in the SBC movement. However, Class's methods, while gaining traction among followers, often led to legal confrontations. Critics argue that his tactics can be legally questionable and potentially harmful. Many of his followers face legal repercussions for filing frivolous or fraudulent claims, leading to financial and legal troubles. Authorities viewed these actions as harassment and a misuse of the legal system, resulting in significant pushback from the courts. Chapter 6 Brandon Adams and Gordon Hall of the financial strategist Sertor, Brandon Adams and Gordon Hall introduced sophisticated financial instruments and insurance schemes to the SPC movement. Their strategies focused on creative financing and asset protection, appealing to those seeking advanced methods for financial management. Okay. For those of you who are not familiar with trusts, let me give you the sweet and simple. Trust has basically four essential parts. A grantor, a trustee, a beneficiary, and res, which is the thing of the trust, okay? Or the property. Could you say one more time? Grantor, trustee, beneficiary, which are the three positions in a trust, and the res, or the property of the trust. Corpus. Corpus is another word for it. Okay. Adams and Hall's methods included the use of private trusts, insurance policies, and intricate financial instruments designed to shield assets from creditors. 
These strategies aim to provide a comprehensive approach to asset protection and financial independence, lining with the SBC movement's goal of reclaiming control over personal finances. Through seminars and workshops, Adams and Hull disseminated their techniques to a wide audience. They promoted the idea that by establishing private trusts, individuals could protect their assets from legal claims and creditors. Insurance schemes and complex financial instruments were also employed to further safeguard wealth and manage liabilities. Their strategies often involved using complex legal and financial structures that required a deep understanding of commercial law and financial instruments. This attracted individuals who were already familiar with or willing to learn about these advanced techniques. However, the intricate nature of these methods also made them susceptible to legal scrutiny. Despite the appeal and potential benefits of their strategies, Adams and Hall faced significant legal challenges. Authorities viewed their methods as potentially fraudulent. Do I want to live under man or do I want to live under God? <clears throat> and it really is that kind of simple. Under man, he has how many codes, rules, statutes, etc.? Oh, oh. Tens and tens of millions of rules, codes, and statutes. And more passed every year. So it's real easy for me to know that I don't want to live under man, nor can I. Because I can't win in his courts. Or its courts. Or this world. I'll be of the world, but not of this world. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Monica Edelstein. I'm an AUSA from the District of Arizona. Your Honors, the government would submit that the instruments in this case, the fictitious financial instruments in this case, are precisely the type of instruments that Congress intended to criminalize under the Statute 514. Appellant seems to be hung up on the use of this phrase money order that was attached to the top of these instruments that Mr. Hall submitted to the IRS. The key inquiry, of course, is not what the documents looked like, but of course their actuality. It's irrelevant what the defendant and his co-defendants put on the top of these instruments. They could have labeled them anything, site drafts, promissory notes, currency. That is truly not part of what is relevant in the inquiry under 514. And it's not the government's burden under 514 to prove that a money order as a financial instrument themselves are false and fictitious. <clears throat> the inquiry that is relevant, the important part of the inquiry, is whether the instruments that were charged, the ones that were made by the defendants in this case, that just simply happened to be labeled money orders, were in and of themselves false and fictitious. In other words, writing money order on an instrument does not make it a real money order. But in creating an instrument here to look like a real money order, when in fact they were simply worthless documents created out of whole cloth, this is what makes them false and fictitious, that they were simply created out of nothing. Um, this brought these particular instruments into the category and the class criminalized by 514. What's the difference? I, I should know this, Nancho, but I do not. What's the difference in terms of proof, punishment, etc.? between charging this as a false or fictitious or charging this as a counterfeit? Uh, Your Honor, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know precisely what the difference in statutory structure are. However, I would note that um, there is no precedent in this circuit or elsewhere that says that a document or a, an instrument has to fall under one category or other, fictitious or counterfeit, to be charged. What's relevant in this case, of course, is that the types of documents we have, the instruments we have, fall precisely into the category of 514, thus making it appropriate to charge these particular instruments under that statute. But, but I gather that the argument uh, made here, at least implicitly, is uh, now. I can be corrected by your adversary, but I think I, I understood him implicitly to concede that if this had been charged as a counterfeit, uh, the argument would go, that argument would go away. Your Honor, uh, whether or not they could be charged under the counterfeit statute is an entirely separate argument. What they can be charged under and what they are in this case, these false two monies, no, are no. false and fictitious. They're um, to the point with respect to, I think the Murphy case puts to bed um, any indication that on the face of these, um, they, they, uh, they couldn't be 
the jury could not infer that they were issued under the authority of the United States. The important thing to also note is there are no money orders issued by the Department of Treasury. It, this simply doesn't exist. Um, and it goes back to the original point that it doesn't matter what the defendants put on these particular documents. It is the, the characteristic and indicia indicated on them that pulls them within the false and fictitious <laughs> statute under 514. Despite their legal troubles, Adams and Hull left a lasting impact on the SBC movement. Their innovative approaches to asset protection and financial management continue to influence those seeking alternative methods to safeguard their wealth. However, their experiences also highlight the importance of understanding and adhering to legal standards and financial practices. G. Ian and David Clarence brought innovative methods to the SBC movement, focused on trust management and asset protection. Ian introduced creative financial instruments, and Clarence emphasize administrative procedures. Their diverse approaches have contributed to the movement's evolution. Susan Tucci's approach centered on the creation and management of private trusts and legal claims, highlighting the importance of legal documentation. Are fucking perfect. Okay, his ownership of the funds, his ownership of the accounts are, are completely perfect. So I made sure you guys all had those documents so you could at least see them. Of course, they're mine. I put everything out in mine just so that I'm taking the responsibility as far as the, and of course I'm communicating real time with people in the industry, uh, the banking industry and financial districts. And so basically all the I's were dotted and T's crossed, they can't touch uh, me personally, just as far as all the work that's being done, they can't touch me. This is America. Don't get you slipping no. Uchi, Ian, and David Clarence brought innovative methods to the SPC movement, focused on trust management and asset protection. Ian introduced creative financial instruments, and Clarence emphasized administrative procedures. Their diverse approaches have contributed to the movement's evolution. Susan Tucci's approach centered on the creation and management of private trusts and legal claims, highlighting the importance of legal documentation and compliance with state laws. Dirty schemes. Ian's teachings emphasized the potential of these instruments to create financial opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, when I did that video, an alternative way, see the proper way to access the Federal Reserve, and let's see if there's anything else. When I, and you see it says 31 CFR 46310, right? It lets you know that you guys have an account. So in that video, I prove a start point. Y'all hold on one second. All right. We're going to stop them right there before they break it down, because then we're going to come back to them when they break it down. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, go back and listen to this video. 2017, the proper way to access the Federal Reserve. Because I want you to pay attention. That's the title. Just type that in YouTube the same as I just did. That's the title. It's the first thing that comes up. Okay. Why you gotta act so excited? Like, yeah, like, yeah, like, just shut up. I want to let you guys know something. That video uses simple logic. But, and again, some of you will understand this. Many of you will not understand this. When I say, when I do these videos, I'm just talking. You... Some of you are going to be stupid about it, but you guys don't realize half the time I'm just talking. And protect personal wealth. David Clarence focused on administrative procedures, advocating. And he, Clarence's approach often involved filing liens and administrative claims against government officials. Where we'll be exploring more of the details of the non-UCC operating as a Article 4 banker and what it means to be a bounty hunter and a private attorney general. Additionally, we will continue to cover the crucial topics of the performance and the payment bonds, essential knowledge for anyone looking to navigate the monetary system as an individual banker. It's important to note that while I'm your guide in this course, I am not the originator of this information. The insights we will explore have been brought to light by many great gurus, uh, but one particularly is Patrick Devine. Movement. While their innovative approaches offered new ways to achieve financial independence and sovereignty, cities, their willingness to explore and teach new methods has inspired many within the community. 
consequences of misapplying financial and legal strategies. I Ian and David Clarence. Beast. The chapter balances the appeal of their strategies with the serious legal risks, offering a comprehensive view of their contributions and the consequences of their practices. Chapter 8, Tony King the Modern Tactician Narrator, Tony King, a modern figure in the SPC movement, focuses on trust management and asset protection. So I just have to alert you that, so you be aware when you're doing your acceptance for value, what you're going to put on the form, okay? So what I want you to do is, on the bottom portion of the form, draw a line on the bottom portion. Now, you know at all times when you're accepting anything for value that that portion gets torn off. No matter what. I, just remember this if you don't remember anything else. It says detach and send with payment. They have already told you the first portion of how to accept something for value. Detach it. That's the first part of the instruction. You're going to rip it in half. Okay, they already got a perforated line for you to do that. And send with payment. With mean two. You need two instruments in order to do acceptance for value and not one. Okay? So if you're going to do any acceptance for value, detach it. That's the bottom portion. And remember, the top portion is a reflection of the bottom portion. See? So if you are doing that, if the top portion is a reflection of what is below, what's going to take place is the top portion is the accepted part. And the coupon is the payment of the accepted part. See? Maximizing financial protection through sophisticated strategies, King's methods include the use of private trusts to manage and protect assets. Yuri. He advocates for a detailed understanding of trust law and the strategic use of legal instruments to minimize tax liabilities and protect assets from potential creditors. King also emphasizes the importance of financial education and literacy. His seminars often cover a broad range of topics, including the legal intricacies of trust management, asset protection, and the ethical considerations of financial planning. Decisions. Key aspects of King's approach is his focus on legal compliance. He encourages his followers to work within the bounds of the law. The future of the SPC movement lies in new, innovative strategies that adhere strictly to all legal rules and regulations, holding the public harmless in their dealings. These strategies focus on trust management, corporate structure, insurance, and operating privately without the use of government accounts to create and profit from public projects. Leading this new wave are advocates like the Noematic Elevation Group, which promotes the Trinity process, and authors such as Bachman Daniels, who are pioneering new paths to financial freedom through private operations. These pioneers emphasize ethical practices and legal compliance, ensuring that their methods do not harm the public or violate existing laws. The Trinity Process, developed by Tobias Bay and the Noematic Elevation Group, is a comprehensive approach that combines trust management, corporate structuring, discharging personal debt, and private insurance strategies. You want to own nothing and control everything. Ownership is a big thing that, that hurts us in understanding finances and being wealthy. How the wealthy stay wealthy is they control things so you can get a different type of write-off. This process aims to provide individuals with the tools to achieve financial sovereignty while maintaining full compliance with legal standards. The Trinity process emphasizes transparency, ethical practices, and a commitment to operating within the bounds of the law. I wonder why you don't see Donald Trump paying taxes, you don't see Elon Musk paying taxes. They're all set up correctly. Mm, wow. They're all operating out of trust. <clears throat> and they're playing the game right. Authors like Bachman Daniels are also at the forefront of this movement, offering insights and guidance on how to operate privately and achieve financial freedom. Daniels' work focuses on the practical application of trust law and corporate structuring, providing a roadmap for individuals seeking to protect their assets and operate outside the constraints of trust.
Traditional financial systems, the emphasis on ethical practices, and legal compliance sets these new pioneers apart from some of their predecessors. By ensuring that their methods hold the public harmless and adhere to all regulations, they are building a sustainable and responsible path to financial sovereignty. Their strategies aim to empower individuals to manage their finances independently while avoiding the legal pitfalls that have plagued the SBC movement in the past. As the SBC movement evolves, these futuristic pioneers are leading the way, advocating for a balanced approach that combines innovation with responsibility. Their work represents a promising future for those seeking financial independence through private means, and their commitment to legal and ethical standards offers a model for sustainable financial practice. Says.